Now, I'm not sure how many of us here this morning are fans of entertaining bad television, but I imbibe from time to time as a guilty pleasure of mine. And there's one show that's entitled, What Would You Do? Have any of you all seen this before? I think it comes across on, I've come across at least on a random Friday night, I think, in my memory, at one point or another, just after like Dateline or one of those mystery news TV programs. And the premise of the show is pretty straightforward. It's actually been a, a TV show formula for decades now at this point. It begins with hidden cameras. And the stage will be set as the crew sets up all sorts of these hidden cameras in a, a relatively otherwise public setting. Maybe it's a restaurant, let's say. And the scene seems normal enough for this unsuspecting person that enters the scene, and we'll call them the, the TV target for our purposes here this morning. But little do they know that everyone else in this public scene including bartenders and patrons and even the person sitting right next to them, well, all, they are all actors. The drama unfolds as the actors initiate a scene that we as average people may experience in normal everyday life, although with a bit of a twist. For example, a disheveled, homeless person walks into a restaurant and sits down a few seats away from this unsuspecting TV target, and that person asks for a glass of water from the bartender, let's say. Now, all of a sudden, the bartender acts out of the ordinary. So maybe he refuses to serve this homeless stranger. Or maybe she ignores him altogether. Or he becomes verbally aggressive with this person and tries to kick them out of the restaurant. In some way, there's obviously something out of the ordinary happening right in front of the TV target's eyes. While all of this is taking place, recorded on cameras, of course, the, the unsuspecting TV target is presented with a dilemma that many of us as the TV audience may experience in our day-to-day -day lives. And so the question obviously becomes, what would you do? In this case, should someone speak up defending this homeless person? Should someone share their own water with them? Do we confront the injustice taking place, speaking up to that bartender, or maybe retrieving the manager on duty? Or do we ignore what's taking place and act as if nothing is wrong? Now, I'm sure that within this crowd here this morning, some of us would have no problem speaking up in that situation. We are people of action. And others of us, well, maybe we're internally weighing the pros and cons to such actions. Maybe even internally deliberating if such behaviors warrant a response in the first place. And still, some of us also may comfortably or uncomfortably ignore what's taking place believing that it's best not to get involved in others' conflicts. Even as silly as some of the presented TV scenarios may seem with this TV show, the premise does leave us questioning our own responsiveness in more serious contexts in life. Do we have an obligation to speak up for others in such scenarios? What justifies putting ourselves or others at risk in the midst of conflict? And maybe a bit more of a larger theological question for us this morning. Are we as Christians called to be people of action? And if so, which values 
do we act upon within our daily living? This morning, I'd like for us to continue our reflection on God's calling in our lives. We've been reflecting on this theme for the past few weeks as we share in today's perhaps relatively new story of Esther. And so we've reflected on how we're called to respond to God's call. We did this last week, but what might it look like for us as Christians to have our actions formed by our identity as followers of Christ? As we can already deduce, a call to action is not always easy or clear. Situations very rarely are black and white. Within our spiritual formation as disciples, we're invited into this complicated and complex practice of putting our faith into action. But what does it look like for us as Christians today in 2024? What would you do? Let's get to this wonderful story once again. So again, we're reading today from the book of Esther, which again tells this story of young Queen Esther, her older cousin Mordecai, who loved Esther as his own daughter. And and this movement of God is taking place throughout this story, although a little piece of trivia here for this morning, the actual name of God is never explicitly named throughout the entire book of Esther. And so we're reading about this royal official, uh, Haman's, evil plot to commit genocide against the Jewish people, about the heroic actions of both Mordecai and Esther, ultimately of God's justice saving the Jewish people, and the judgment and death for the hateful Haman and other evildoers. Now the Jewish people retell this story each year as a holiday called Purim today. And this is actually going to be taking place March 23rd, for those of you who'd like to participate maybe with friends uh, or local Jewish congregations here. A day of feasting and joy for many. It's humor in the face of death and thanksgiving for God's saving works. Here we are in one of the more dramatic and action-filled moments of the story. And however, it's important to remember that Esther was not always acting as fearless and as heroic as we read here when we uh, go through this scripture once again. Esther was just a young girl after all, keeping secret her Jewish identity. In many ways, her ability to not ruffle any feathers kept her in good favor with those royal officials and the king in particular who fell in love with her beauty and her ability to maybe stay in line when speaking. Mordecai, now, on the other hand, was not as quiet. It was his ability to speak up that found him in good favor with the king on one instance, and it was also his speaking up that found him as an enemy against Haman. And so when Haman's plot to eradicate the Jewish people was revealed to Mordecai, He understandably was upset and let his beloved Esther know about such a plot. This is also, understandably, a very tough spot for Esther to be in at this situation. Here she has been wisely navigating these palace politics to find her present place as queen of all the kingdoms. In many people's eyes, Esther was living her best life from rags to riches. And yet, her very identity as a Jewish person placed upon her a responsibility to care for her own, to try and do anything to protect her cousin Mordecai, the Jewish people, and her own life. I'm sure she spent hours Days weighing every possible scenario, every possible option on how to safely navigate this extremely precarious predicament. She knew the consequences of possibly speaking up about this dangerous situation, and she she tells Mordecai as much through her servants. But Mordecai's response cuts to the bone of Esther's fears. 
Who knows, maybe, maybe he knew her so well that he knew just the right words to say. Or maybe Esther had already been weighing these politically uh, charged options for such a decision. Or maybe, maybe, God's very voice was being heard through the words of Esther's cousin on that day. Verse 13, once again of chapter 4, Mordecai replied to Esther, Do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's family, well, you will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. And that was enough for Esther. She made her decision. She would risk her life by approaching the king and informing him of this evil plot and also confessing her own identity as a Jewish woman. Verse 15 again, Then Esther replied to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and Hold a fast on my behalf. After that, I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Friends, the good news for us this morning, in our calling as God's beloved children, God invites us to take actions towards realizing God's kingdom on earth here today. It seems like simple enough thought at first, but as we think about it further, we realize just how complex and challenging this invitation, this this calling in our lives can be. And let's be honest here. Living as a child of God comes with some unanticipated challenges at times. Yes, there are consequences to following Jesus as a disciple. Yes, there are risks involved when we are led by the very Spirit of God. And the outcomes of such predicaments are rarely black and white. We're often living with many shades of gray moments in our lives with no one easy answer to the questions we have, even after we've taken such actions. Should we be protesting militarism and violence as Christians, as peacemakers in an age of war and terror? Should we speak up as a person of faith in an increasingly secularized society? Should we take a stance and make steps towards realizing our own anti-racist values as Christians today? How do we navigate these murky societal and spiritual waters we find ourselves in? And so if you have similar questions like I do, I, I'd like to offer us three tools or, or first steps, perhaps, that we can use as Christians when confronting such challenging moments in our lives. And the first is that when in doubt, we as Christians must go back to the Scriptures. And we must go back to the words and actions of Jesus in particular when we have such questions. What would Jesus say if he saw a homeless person asking for a glass of water at a restaurant? Sometimes the answer becomes quite apparent when we simply ask that question, what would Jesus do? And maybe if that's not as clear for us other times, admittedly, the the appropriate action isn't always clear, then I'd suggest tool number two, sometimes the teachings of Jesus, well, they get complicated when we translate them to modern day life. And so in this case, when the words and actions of Jesus are not always clear for our present day circumstance, perhaps it's also helpful to discern our potential actions together within 
a community of faith. How do our brothers and sisters in Christ understand the situation? We live into this as Presbyterians. Whenever we gather to worship, to pray, to, to have committee meetings or session meetings, is there a faithful response that we can decipher together when the way is not always clear? And then finally, a third way to discern our call to action in this tumultuous world at times. Well, maybe this should be the first. It's the practice of prayer. We often overlook the power of prayer in our day-to-day living. This should be the underlying foundational practice of our daily existence. When we open our minds to listening first to God's voice, And acting second, I believe God speaks to our hearts and minds in clarifying ways. What is God saying to you in this moment? How is the Spirit of God moving in your heart these days? Look. No one ever said that responding to God's call in our lives, that living as a C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N is easy. But as a loved, forgiven, and called people, we are invited to realize God's kingdom together through the, the words that we speak and the actions that illuminate our values in this world and the next. We do have tools to help us in following Jesus. And we're reminded that we are never alone. God has claimed us in the waters of baptism. The the very Spirit of God leads us through the wilderness of life's ups and downs, and we have our brothers and sisters to the left and to the right of us. That great cloud of witnesses of all peoples, of all times and places, to guide us together as a people of faith. Mordecai, well, he reminded Esther during that fateful moment of decision As he asked the question, who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. And today we are likewise invited to ponder such a question as we, as followers of Christ, are called to action. Who knows? Perhaps you have been called for just such a time as this. Alleluia. Amen.